Welcome to Technovation. I'm your host, Peter High. My guest today is Mark Mills. Mark is a senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute and a faculty fellow at Northwestern University's McCormick School of Engineering and Applied Science, where he co-directs an institute on manufacturing science and innovation. He's also a strategic partner with Montrose Lane, an energy tech venture fund. In his past experiences, Mark was a member of the Reagan administration as well. Mark's latest book, The Cloud Revolution, How the Convergence of New Technologies Will Unleash the Next Economic Boom and a Roaring 2020s, was referred to by Steve Forbes as, quote, a timely antidote to the debilitating pessimism that now reigns. I look forward to covering all of the above with him in this conversation. Mark, great to speak with you today. Welcome to Technovation. That's a, a generous introduction, Peter, and thank you. I, you know, it's funny, the, your father-in-law uh, nailed something, which I write about in my book, uh, and, and, and part of the animation for my interest in what I did when I wrote in the book is that the the cloud, and we'll talk about this, but what, yeah. the, what the architecture of the cloud is doing, what, what most people don't really, I, I think, understand, practitioners do, is that the, precisely the problem that your father-in-law faces and the siloization of expertise uh, can be uh, significantly addressed, not conquered, we never conquer it, with what uh, AI cloud access um, what might be called a semantic internet, you could talk to computers, those kinds of things uh, make, will make a profound difference to what a physician can do to sort of break down these silo barriers. And this has been a very tough area to conquer, probably the hardest space to manage information and expertise, arguably is uh, in, in healthcare and medicine. And nobody knows this better than doctors and, yeah. and clinicians, but it's a very, very difficult area, technically difficult, uh, personally difficult because you're dealing with people's lives. And uh, it's not been amenable to the automation that everybody's excited about everywhere else. Well, yeah, that's a great points that you raise. I do want to get into the details of what you're describing and the power of the cloud and technology, more generally speaking, to break down some of those barriers or foster greater levels of con uh, of collaboration. Uh, you referenced, by the way, your your latest book, which, is, which I have here, uh, The Cloud Revolution, how the convergence of new technologies will unleash the next economic boom. I do want to actually spend a good uh, portion of our conversation on the thesis and some of the um, hypotheses that you that you put out there through the book. I want to actually take one quick look back, though. When you and I first met a few years ago, you were speaking about a, a book that you were in the throes of writing and that you've you put out, a, a, you know, in recent times as well called Digital Cathedrals, uh, right. which in some ways was the predecessor to this text. Exactly. And I wonder if you could take a quick moment and and and, and highlight uh, your your thesis or theses relevant to this conversation uh, from the Digital Cathedrals as a starting point. You know, the... Uh... And I appreciate that. I mean, they, the, the, so the digital cathedrals, it was in fact um, a predicate. It was the beginning sort of laying out the architecture of an argument for something that's much bigger than just than just the cloud, which is of course, uh, as I point, I try to make in digital cathedrals is a big deal. I, I chose that title just sort of um, arcane only because of the uh, fact that societies you know build things build infrastructures build buildings that aren't just meant to um you know impress people you build I mean, skyscrapers uh were built because they have sort of an uh, an incredibly important economic function they're they're epicenters of innovation and wealth creation in cities you know there's a certain amount of pride attached to them of course i mean that's human nature but that's really what their function was they were made possible by the convergence of technologies uh, more than a century ago that could let you do things like have elevators. Without elevators, you can't have skyscrapers that required electricity and control systems. Uh, it made, was made possible high strength steels and high strength concrete road systems to feed them because you, without roads and cars, the skyscrapers would be maxed out by horses and buggies long before you got above, you know, a few a few story, a few dozen stories. When the first skyscraper was built in New York City, the New York Times called it a cathedral of commerce, which is a great line. And they were entirely right. And of course, the, the disquisition about how magnificent this was, was focused very much not on what it cost, but how it would stimulate commerce, which was why they called it a cathedral of commerce. And, you know, but I did some research because they're, it's fascinating on the history of cathedral construction, because it turns out cathedrals were also uh, cathedrals literally of commerce. Obviously, cathedrals are religious buildings and designed to celebrate. 
and for people to gather and pray. But they uh, cathedrals uh, were profoundly important epicenters of commerce throughout the throughout history. It's where people gathered for the fairs, and uh, partly because they were expensive, partly because they were you know geographically visible. All the things that people know. So I conflated the two, but and I did that because in the 21st century we're building infrastructures comprised of physical buildings, data centers, and communications networks that are really our digital cathedrals. We we have this reverence for the digital tech titans because they're wealthy and powerful, they're changing the world, all that stuff. Or we have the fear of them if you're if you're on that side of the equation. I mean, everything has yin and yang, but. From a sheer economic perspective, there is nothing in history, really. I mean, they say this, and it sounds like hyperbole. We all like to engage in some hyperbole. But there really is nothing in history at the scale of the infrastructure that we're building up called the cloud, at the epicenter of which are the digital cathedrals. So I, maybe put it in, um, I guess, building terms. I mean, comparing to skyscrapers, we're building up far more square footage by, by tens of millions of square feet of data centers than we are skyscrapers right now. They cost about the same to build. So it's kind of interesting per square foot, but we're building far more millions of square feet at a far faster rate of data centers than we are of skyscrapers. But data centers are less visible because there's typically hidden way either in buildings that you don't know that they're data centers in downtown or they're remote out on the countryside uh, where you have land because they, they look like warehouses to people if you drove by it, but they just, there's no trucks around them, but no one notices that. In dollar terms, just to give a sense of the build rate, because if you're in business, in the end, it's what money that matters, right? Uh, the spend rate on building uh, the cloud, which is dominated by the digital cathedrals at the center, is greater than the spend rate of all global utilities to add physical infrastructure to the electric utility system around the world. So it's an astonishing amount of money going into hardware and capital and infrastructure, growing, not slowing, growing at an accelerating rate. And considering that the utility of function of the digital infrastructure grows at a rate faster than its simple dollar addition compared to other infrastructure, then it's even more amazing. You know, a dollar of new skyscraper, assuming no inflation, which is a tough thing to assume these days, gets you the, roughly the same amount of no economic utility as the previous dollar. Each marginal dollar in the digital infrastructure, in a digital cathedral, the cloud, doesn't get you the same amount of utility as you had in the previous dollar. It's getting you somewhere in the order of 10 times the utility. I mean, this is really unprecedented. So in absolute dollar terms, spending is taken off. But the economic utility, the social utility of the machines is growing at an even faster rate. This, this is quite literally unprecedented in, in economic and world history. So it's, we live at a fascinating time. And the cloud's a new thing. I mean, the first cloud uh, data center was an Amazon cloud data center, unsurprisingly, uh, was built 2006. You could say the first data center, if you want to just take it out of the, the cloud, nomenclature, those were built in the late 90s. So we're talking about a very recent phenomena that we're at the proverbial um, end of the beginning, right, of the build out. Oh, that's a long, that's a long, you know, preamble on what <laughs> digital cathedrals led to, but they should have to think about what does it mean? What are the threads? What are people doing with this stuff? And that's why my book, The Cloud Revolution, amplifies on that, looking at how it affects machines, manufacturing machines, transportation machines, how it affects the material space of our world, because everything is built for materials. You, you, nothing exists without materials. That's really interesting. And, and just as you began that response, as you did your, your, your prior book, Digital Cathedrals, with the comparison to cathedrals and skyscrapers, that is uh, having an analogy from the past uh, pulled forward to an application in the present. Uh, likewise, in the cloud revolution, you talk about how, uh, you know, 100 years ago, there was a, a global pandemic. <laughs> um, there was the third biggest economic crisis of the 20th century. Uh, you, you had um, all sorts of consternation uh, due to the health and economic crises and, and a lot of, um, you know, difficulty uh, you know, politically, uh, socially, 
um, uh, happening in, in the world then as well, as well as in our country here in the United States. And I, I found it fascinating to, 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 to have that sort of um, pull forward and application of what was happening in the past as, as a precursors to what we're seeing now, and even in some, to some degree, helping presage what might come from this point forward, which is really kind of where, where you get into the meat of this. But it, briefly, if you would, take us back to 1918 to 1920 uh, and talk a little bit, little bit about the, some of the dynamics relevant from that time um, as they might apply, as which we'll get into that part of the conversation as well, to the present times. It, it, I, I did that, as you, you know, the, in fact, the, the book's architectural story is pulling the relevant analogs from the past briefly into the present because the that old adage, and I think Mark Twain is supposed to have said it, right? History doesn't repeat, it rhymes. I mean, what, what he was referring to, which a lot of historians know and write about, is that there are patterns, right? Patterns of behavior tell you something. So that's the rhyming. You don't get exact repetition, but the pattern tells you something. Uh, and it tells you something, especially in technology domains, because you see patterns of innovation that lead to an outcome that is uh, predictive. And so it's not predictive in the sense of you could predict an Amazon would exist if, if you were in 1984, but you could predict a lot about where computers were going in 1984. And I subtitled the book, The Roaring 2020s, because it, it, it seemed like too easy to, to do that because of the original Roaring Twenties, but it, tur it, tur it turned out that wasn't, it was a quasi-accidental because what I was looking for were the patterns. When was the last time we had a pattern uh, of innovation that was similar to what's going on today? Innovation in the three spheres of technology and the three spheres of technology are information, how we measure, communicate uh, materials, how we build things and machines. And how we how we make and operate things. Those are the three spheres of everything. There's not everything falls into one of those three buckets. And when the intersection of those uh, domains is where we get revolutions. Last time we had this profound intersection of the maturation of technologies in those three domains was right after the turn of the 20th century, in the early 1900s. In the 1920s is when when things took off. That's when home ownership uh, took off. That's when car ownership took off. That's when electrification took off. That's when the pharmaceuticals and chemical industries took off. And that's when telephony took off. And that's when the professionalization of science took off because of information exchange. All those things were invented far earlier, but the maturations occurred roughly in 1920. But the interesting thing was, to your point, in 1920, it was a really miserable time. I mean, we not only came out of a pandemic, which set aside what you what we think we know about the data from the past and the data of the present, based on what everybody believes is true. It was a pandemic in the United States that killed 400% more people per capita. So it was, a, to say it was severe is an understatement, right? We came out of a world war, which was horrific by, by, by any measures. We were also at a time where uh, the Western world was very worried about revolutions because of the 1917 Bolshevik revolution and the rise of Leninism, communism. So the Red Scare was 1920. As you pointed out, the third biggest recession in the 20th century was 1920. Uh, and, and the by the way, the pandemic lasted into 1921. There were three waves. Surprise, you know, positions, no <laughs> viruses go in waves. And uh, the third wave was consequential as, as, as the previous two were. But also there were race riots in America that were I mean, for those who have who didn't read that history, you could use you know the magic Google machine and get a reasonably accurate history, or at least you get pointers to to accurate histories. Horrific race riots in the United States. Charleston, South Carolina, was uh, had martial law imposed. People, hundreds of people were killed. Where were blacks and whites were murdering each other in riots of horrific proportion. The U.S. Army Air Force bombed. A black neighborhood in Tulsa, Oklahoma. There's a new book out on that. The country was in real political turmoil, and we had two amendments to the U.S. Constitution in that one year in 1920. Two in one year. I mean, it's hard to get any of the amendment. One of them was uh, uh, something that, in hindsight, everybody thinks was obvious should have happened. Women got the vote. Obviously, women should have got the vote. Let's just, you know, we don't have to debate that. It was very controversial at that time. The state of Tennessee was the one that pushed it over the edge. It wasn't like a you, you, unanimous, oh, it's obvious, we'll give women the vote. I mean, in the perfect lens of hindsight, it looks obvious, but at that time it wasn't obvious. It was politically a uh, volatile issue. 
And we had prohibition as a constitutional amendment. We, I mean, the American government banned the consumption of a substance that had been uh, invented and consumed since before written history. Uh, you know, you can have lots of opinions about drinking and, and driving and its health effects, but it it's, wasn't exactly a new a product. And, uh, and it, stayed, it stayed illegal, by the way, people have forgot, for 13 years. So in terms of stickiness of government policy, <laughs> once you keep in mind <laughs> that we had, and and let's let's also calibrate it this way because I think this important in a, in a sense that because I people accuse me of being an optimist and we have terrible things going on today. How could you be optimistic about technology? Okay, let's consider other times in history. Yeah. Uh, we're worried about news and and to, to use the now uh, infamous phrase fake news, right? That what's going on in the world today. We have good reason to be worried about that. We should we should care a lot about getting accurate information. But in the around 1920, that was the apotheosis of the newspaper publishing industry in America. 20,000 plus newspapers existed in America alone. Most newspapers published, many of them, three times a day. You got a morning, afternoon, and an evening edition. So think of the quantity of news and the velocity of news at that time. There wasn't enough stuff to write about. That was the dawn of yellow journalism. Newspapers were making up, literally, literally making up fake news or making up stories. That's where the world yellow journalism came from. They just, you just need to get people to buy the paper. Today, we'd call it clickbait. Then it was just called getting <laughs> getting subscribers. In fact, as, as an example, again, I'll end with one more example of sort of the uh, importance of having a, a sense that, that all this turmoil could go on, but yet 1920s saw the beginning of the biggest expansion of technology and wealth in all of human history. Next 80 years, we still did stupid stuff. We still had wars. We still had other diseases. Had more. We had more pandemics, less or less severe. But the expansion of wealth and well-being in America and around the West world was unprecedented in human history because of technology. So, 1924 in Minnesota, uh, a newspaper published a piece of fake news about a politician, totally made up. It resulted in the Minnesota legislature passing a law that gave a judge without a jury the power to shut down, permanently shut down a newspaper if the judge decided the newspaper had published fake news. Pretty amazing. That did not get challenged uh, and reach the Supreme Court for six years. For six years. So that law was in the book for six years. And when it got to the Supreme Court of the United States, finally, it was re repealed by one vote. You would think in our time, this was, this was a landmark case, of course, for freedom of speech. But we take for granted freedom of speech. But here we were with the <laughs> with a potential to shut down news on the recognizance of a single judge without a trial. So yes. that that was a context of the time. What happened then? Well, we know what happened then. We got pharmaceuticals, we got polymers. Uh, yeah, what, yeah, there's side effects that are not ideal, but we got no one would want to live without any of those things today. We got automobile went from a, a few percent of homes in the 1920s to 40% of homes and then to 90% of homes, right? We got the radio came along and changed communication forever, starting in, in the early 1920s. Went from no homes to the radio to 80% of homes to the radio in that decade. Uh, a radio then cost as much as the entire furniture budget for a home. So, which by the way is what cell service costs most people today. Most people's technology services are roughly equal to their annual budget for, for, for furnitures again. So that framing, I began you know, the book with that context to say, look, we should be asking today, what kinds of things that are equivalent to that that are going on and are they genuinely equivalent? Again, in the three spheres of the machinery, then we had the machines of motors, power plants, airplanes, and cars. And what kind of material revolutions are going on? Then we had the advent of the pharmaceutical and chemical revolutions, which brought very productive changes to everything from food production, food safety, to uh, obviously human safety with pharmaceuticals, to machines. I mean, the, the change in the kinds of machines we had access to make stuff, uh, the beginning of automation was then, the programmable logic was already well understood and possible with electrical machines. It was only a few years later, we got the programmable logic controllers that uh, came along uh, only a couple decades after the 1920s. So the, those things in combination is what caused American wealth, per capita wealth 
in real inflation adjusted terms to expand 700% from 1920 to 2000. Yeah. So I'm contending that we're there again, hence the roaring 2020s, and that it will have an effect equal to the effect of last time, and in my opinion, probably greater because of the amplification effect of the cloud. That's the essence of the sort of the thread is the cloud is an amplifier of talent, skills, research, development of unprecedented proportions, but we're only at the beginning of figuring out how to use the cloud to do things other than what we're doing, which is the easy part, is zooming, okay. Well, that's like the advent of radio in 1920s and television in the 1950s. It's a big deal, but it it doesn't change productivity in the way people would like. Yeah, you're great great points. And you, you call out the fact that just as in the 20 in the 1920s, information, machines, materials, that those were sort of the, the three major ingredients that led to profound uh, innovation and invention, that it's actually those three categories again as you project forward in the decade ahead with obviously different outcomes, different resources, and so on that are represented in those three categories are going to be the the, the mechanism by which a new boom takes place. Um, talk a bit about the confluence. Now, now projecting forward, it's great to have that historical context and some of the similarities to remind us that history rhymes, as Mark Twain says, as you pointed out. Uh, but talk about the, the, the modern context now as to how these things, three things come together and why you believe that, if anything, the decade ahead will, will roar even greater than uh, the, the decade 100 years ago. Well, before I get a specific, I think the the reason I'm sure the decade of the war is because I'm not making predictions about things that are going to happen, but things that have already happened. Yeah. So it was the Peter Drucker line. He said he stopped forecasting anything except what, what had already happened. <laughs> and he was serious about that, right? He's talking about demographic trends. They tell you a lot. But also, if somebody has invented something and it's reached um, close to commercial maturity or it's commercially viable uh, and it's consequential, so uh, then you look at it to that. What are the consequences, right? But you're not looking at an invention of an idea for which there's no commercial viability. So we knew nuclear fission was possible uh, long before uh, first fission in 1939. It was known actually three decades earlier. Lise Meisner, a woman, German physicist, figured it out. Uh, But you you would have a hard time saying anything and said, what's a big deal, nuclear fission? They knew it was a big deal. It became a bigger deal in 1950 when we could actually build a nuclear power plant. So that took 50 years from an idea to a commercially viable. And we're still having uh, challenges building at scale with these, this particular technology. So anyway, so I looked across the landscape of what's, be, what's already been done in, this, in the three spaces. But if, if let's put it in the context of the things that everybody cares about today, like supply chain, uh, the labor force and maybe inflation. I mean, what, those are the things that are sort of in the news today. And if I were picking an example of a forecast of why we're on the cusp of uh, material changes and dealing with those persistent problems and all, you know, all, we always have those three problems, right? First, the supply chain, when we re- rediscovered our supply chains, like what a surprise. I mean, the Romans had supply chains. <laughs> we, we, we've, but our supply chains are more complex. Oh, gee, what a surprise. It was, you know, it was billions of people make, making billions of kinds of products that never existed before. So we have a complicated supply chain. But what we have now, which we've never had before, and we're only using lightly so far, are the capabilities to detect, sense, monitor, exchange information about everything from mind mouth to consumer in a secure way. Now, the security part matters, right? We're not, we, we now know how to do that. Pretty well, you know. Blockchain is the the word of the of the of the decade, if you like. Typically applied to cryptocurrency, but the relevance to blockchain is its security feature. That plus ubiquitous connectivity, which is part of the cloud, low cost connectivity, low cost sensors, which is again part of, of the cloud. With AI, with machine learning and artificial intelligence as an assistance, we can begin to tease out of the complexity of supply chains the kind of information you'd want to have in a simple supply chain, you can apply to complex ones. If I ship something today, knowing where the world is going in terms of the ships available, the cost of fuel, port congestion, alternative suppliers, customers' willingness to change their opinions, we we know what all the features are you put in. You can actually 
we know we can make software that can begin to give intelligent advice, not conclusions. This is a very big deal in the transformation of computing from calculating an outcome to estimating an outcome and giving advice. But that's what machine learning and AI now allow combined with all the data inputs. Will that help supply chain uh, visibility and therefore tamp down the challenges you get from peaks and valleys? We just had a peak. We had a peak because people stopped spending money on services and entertainment. And they spent money on goods. What a surprise. If you take out 10% of the workforce, let's just say on the front lines of a supply chain and increase the demand for goods by just say 10%, not big numbers, that 20% gap in a physical system and a supply chain is gets you exactly what we got, the congestion and the high prices. So the cloud sensors, materials enables that. If you think about the other big uh, issue, workforce, we have the sort of great transition, right? People have decided they can quit. Well, okay, we'll see how long many of them stay unemployed because the demand for labor is so high. That just means they have options. So that transformation means that they've learned that they have negotiating power, especially in the skilled trades. So day labor rates we saw today in the Wall Street Journal uh, are up 66% over 2019 day labor. That's a pretty high jump on day labor rates for construction and good for them, right? Except if you're on the receiving end where you try to build a building or a house, how do you solve that problem? Well, you, you want to amplify the skills of the people that you're going to have to hire. That's called robots, automation, and machines. That's what we've always done. Are the robots getting good enough? They actually are, uh, but they're a little too expensive. So, But that problem gets solved when they actually amplify a high cost or high value worker. Similarly, the uh, other contemporaneous challenge in labor is the so-called uh, silver tsunami, the retiring of the typically older skilled workforce, the skilled trades are dominated by older people, mostly men, but a lot of women too. How do you how do you upskill people who don't have those skills? Well, you do that with machines. I mean, the the fact that we can now bring and are bringing to training in the skilled trades the kinds of simulators that have been typical in aviation for a century is consequential and underappreciated. The reason pilots could be trained quickly and more effectively started when Link, 100 years ago, invented the Link simulator, which is still its derivative machines are, are now required to train any pilot. Planes are big machines, they're expensive. Because they're really expensive, you can afford expensive simulators. But if I start making cheaper simulators, the cost balance between the cost of the thing I'm trying to train you to use, the equation starts to sort of align, right? So we already have Caterpillar, Deer, and all these companies have simulators for training people how to run excavators, right? You, you do the simulator first before you run a real machine. We have that for physicians now. There's already several companies making simulators that allows quasi-real uh, practice on surgery prior to do, doing it on you or me. What's not to love about that? That'll get much better outcomes. We, it's self-evident why it'll get better outcomes. All that's possible because of the constellation of things that are in the cloud, high, high quality, high power computing and software, but also uh, the feedback mechanisms that are called haptics that allow the person doing the training to feel a quasi or even close to realistic inputs. That's a material science and machine advance that's been extremely difficult to achieve. And, is being achieved. And it's a combination, again, of machines and materials, not just computing. The com computing can say, I, I, I want you to feel uh, the ball when you grab it in the virtual environment, but doesn't that I still have a hand. My hand has to get tactile feedback. So we know that those things are, are possible and are being deployed now. So that whole space of training and the, the concern, which, but for the advent of these new technologies, I think would be a permanent drag on the economy for the next decade. We would have insufficient quantity of labor, we'd be paying more for it, we'd have higher cost goods and more congested supply chains. All those things now, when we knew we could in theory ameliorate them for two decades, you can talk to almost anybody in business and what they're saying in every, every kind of business from manufacturing to hospitals is the, the kinds of tools they've been offered by entrepreneurs that they've been reluctant to try 
because they're being offered them. It's not like they have to guess they're available. They're now trying. Now, that's the first step. We always stumble on the way to these new, these new modalities in every business. So it's an ever perfect transition. You don't flip a switch and Robbie the robot shows up and helps the nurse carry the patient, right? It doesn't work quite that easily. But we do know that we can deploy ambulatory robots, whether they're on wheels or whether they're walking is harder, that's coming, to, to do something as simple as help somebody lift the patient which used to take two people, led to a lot of back injuries. Th those, are, those kinds of incremental things are already showing up in warehouses. They'll end up in hospitals. But in warehouses, we have a shortage of labor. Where would you want your expensive person to work? Unloading boxes from a truck or managing a, uh, four robots that unload boxes from a truck? So that latter is where, where we're going. We don't have to imagine it. There's at least three box unloading robots <laughs> being uh, tried out. Boston Dynamics famously has, has a very clever one. I don't mean they're walking robot. This is a robot on wheels, which drags a conveyor behind it and has arms. And this is where the material science part comes in. It's, it's grabber is not like your hands. These are hard to replicate, but you don't need that for a box. You have these soft grabbers that look like pneumatic pads that grab the box without damaging it and move it. This all comes from the new classes of materials that we've been able to figure out how to engineer in the polymer space. And where do the guys figure out how to engineer this in the polymer space? We'll come back full circle to my digital cathedrals. They do their experimentation and design on polymers in silico. Before they mix it in a vat, they have software that can emulate how chemistry works and you try your chemicals out in silico. You still have to do it in real life, but you get 90% of the way to solving your chemical problem to make a new material in the computer's experimental space in silico instead of in humans. These, these are, uh, you know, the more, I the more I research this stuff in my book, you can probably tell, the, the more I became convinced that I was right, this is not a hypothesis, this is happening, the more exciting it became because the more examples you'd find across every domain space of uh, the three, these three features uh, really changing the game. Uh, in the short term, not not in the year 2050. Yeah, great great overview. I, I really appreciate that. We just got a few a few minutes left here, Mark. I wanted to also make the point. Uh, that, sorry, to raise the point that you make, which is, and forgive me, you alluded to this a little bit, but I, I maybe we we um, uh, underscore this a little bit further. That one of the areas that people worry about so much about uh, the advancements in technology is the impact they will have on the job market. That jobs will go away, as surely will be the case. But you point out one of the great uh, statistics you provide, which I'm certainly going to keep at a front of mind for my conversations, is that the, the, the jobs that were available in 1960, 60% of them don't exist today. And we don't have 60% unemployment <laughs> currently. Right. You know, most of those were were, were uh, the people who whose jobs went away found other employments uh, and found new opportunities and 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 pivoted uh, as was necessary across those times. Moreover, it's not like sixty percent of 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 jobs went away in one day. It's a gradual right. evolution that happens, as will will likely to be the case here as well. And I think it's important for us to bear some of those things in mind. That of course it's important to have retraining programs and think about ways in which we will, will help those people that will be impacted first, but also recognize that uh, um, it's not as though this is going to be a light switch that's turned off uh, in terms of job opportunities from that perspective as well. I, I mean, that's, I mean, that you're exactly right. I mean, and so the, if it were the case that automation uh, eliminated work, and we'd been automating since the time of Hero of Alexandria, there'd be nobody working. We'd have one machine doing everything. So, the, the interesting thing about automation today compared to before is the architecture of machines that are taking jobs away and creating new ones. That's what, what happens. We get we net create work. But to your point, we, we have a retraining requirement. Well, the very technology that is eliminating certain kinds of jobs, it makes it easier to train people for the new jobs because the kinds of training that can be done both through simulators, like that we're talking about, as well as just through finding a job. If you lost a job in 1960, because they got automated away, which happened, and you lived in Cleveland, you'd have a hard time finding a job in Nashville you'd have to buy their paper. That's, that's so easy today on, 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 right on, on networks to find jobs elsewhere. Obviously, you still have to move, but people have been moving around America. We're one of the most mobile cultures in, in the world. So that 
that is also a, a unique thing. When, when, you know, the automated loom, the famous Luddites, right? That technology didn't help the people who lost their job and they lost jobs. Luddites were right. They lost their jobs, but it didn't help them get retrained. It didn't help them find a job elsewhere, right? That's what technology is doing today. So not perfect. Yeah, we still need safety programs. We need to have sensible political solutions. All, all that's, I mean, I, how, could, how can you want to deny that? But, but we have more opportunity to, to help fix it than we ever had before. That's very interesting, Mark. Thank you. As you look ahead to what you've described as the roaring 2020s, as the subtitle of your book suggests, uh, do you have any view on what new players will become winners? And are there any existing winners that you're concerned about? Yeah, you know, well, obviously the business question that follows, I mean, there's there's both policy and business implications as soon as you start laying out tr- big transformations in any industry, right? That's uh, business, governments can slow things down. Uh, as you know, as I put in my early preface, we can, one can Sovietize an economy. It's been done. So I worry about that. If I'm a business, I'm an investor, you think, oh, who, who wins, who loses, right? And uh, the phraseology of digital natives versus, you know, digital immigrants. And it's great. It's a great taxonomy because the world is at that phase now where you have those two kinds of businesses and, and natives sort of get it naturally. Those who don't, but what, but as the utility value rises, as the digital tools become easier to use, then it becomes less of a bifurcation of skills of understanding what the tools are and how to use them versus there's just great tools. And then, then I think that the advantage can shift. This presumes management awareness and all the things that go with, but this, let's just say generic can shift to the, we'll call it the, uh, the Adams natives, right? If, if I'm trying to run a mine, mining copper is not so easy. Okay. Uh, it's different than building a data center and doing software and there's human beings involved that if you know how to, if you've got really useful tools, the guy that knows how to run a mine ought to have the advantage. This will, this will apply to booksellers. It's going to apply to clothiers. It'll, all these things, it's got to be true. It's just hyper true. The, the further you go upstream into these very difficult uh, physical industries. So I would say when you look at companies that are uh, at, at risk, there are the ones that are uh, slow to decide that we've gone from uh, we'll call it digital boutique stuff to just it's every day. It's like skipping electrification when they you know staying with a you know belt driven water belt driven factory long after it was obvious electric motors were better, but they were still harder to do because you had to rewire your factory. All those things you know were difficult. So that's a long way of saying. Uh, I mean, I'm bullish if I were picking companies. I think Amazon, setting aside all the politics incredibly well-run company. Uh, Microsoft, incredibly well-run. I think the two of them have uh, potential to, to last a century like Sears did. Sears and Roebuck had a hell of a century. Uh, we'll have lots of companies like Univac, Sperry, uh, Wang, Digital Equipment. Uh, we can go down through a long list of the, you know, the Dow, look who disappeared. Uh, I, I think it's really hard to figure out who really wins and loses uh, it, it, when it goes, when we go into this another phase where I think the digital tools have become useful. G- good example, when I first started talking uh, to corporate executives about using the cloud for data storage, data processing, first reaction five years ago, I'm sure you saw it was oh, not safe. You know, I, the security, this, that, that's gone, right? This is totally gone. That's why the cloud's taken off because it's cheaper, safer, faster, upgrades faster. That's going to happen in robotics, if I'm picking an, an example. I think some of the really big winners will be companies like Hyundai, which I think made a prescient move in buying uh, Boston Dynamics, uh, you know, anthropomorphic class of you know, free-roaming robotics are the only kinds of machines that can really help in human environments. Uh, you know, bolted down machines in cages are great. The automotive industry has been doing that since the first robot uh, that they put in the Lordstown factory, by the way. In, in 19, uh, I think it was 50, 58. I forgot my date here. So once they're, those, those businesses will succeed. I think uh, it's a very interesting, interesting play. And you see uh, warehouse businesses that are adopting automation faster than the ones that don't want to. Again, all the caveats, you can do those things wrong, as you know, 
and spend a lot of money and get no results. Long answer. So I, I am developing, by the way, uh, a, uh, what I think is an investment implication thesis from my book. I'm just going to map out, we'll call it winners and losers. A lot of them are private companies today. People doing really clever things in material science are almost all private companies. Same is true in uh, robotics and automation. Same is true, in, especially in the medical space. Uh, the, the ones that are easy to take public are now going public through SPACs, but those are the ones that are obvious, you know, battery companies. I mean, that's a materials play. Okay. Uh, I think that train left the station. The more interesting materials play is getting the materials, not putting them in the batteries. Yeah. Mark, great. Thank you for a great conversation. As a reminder, again, the book is The Cloud Revolution, How the Convergence of New Technologies Will Unleash the Next Economic Boom and a Roaring 2020s. Uh, as always, great to speak with you. Thank you so much for sharing your insights today. Thanks, Peter. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it.